progress. Um, but the book is finished and published and for sale. Do you still have copies? Did you sell them all? There's just this one. Someone can buy this. Somebody can buy this copy, which Julia will sign for you. Um, so Michael and Julia will be in conversation about her book. Um, she will read some excerpts from it. Michael will share some new poems with us. Um, and I'll let you take it away. You don't, didn't come here to hear me talk. OK, thank you for being here, Julia. Michael Robbins. Is the, I got I I got it I got it. Nice. What what number is that one? This one's one. I like that. This one's eighty. What number is that? Uh, this is mic number six. Six. Thank you, six. Thank you. Okay. So yes, hello. Hi. So I thought we would just begin by having Julia uh, say a little bit about what throw yourself away writing and masochism is about. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so <clears throat> this book is a book that uh, has essays in it that I started writing about 10 years ago. Um, and as a whole, the book, I never know, like, am I looking at you or am I looking at you? To all? just stare deep into my eyes. Okay. Um, no. The, uh, masochism and writing, wanting to understand the relationship between those two things. They seem to me to be connected in my own life, and they also seem to me to be connected in many other places. Um, the question of kind of um, how a particular sexual disposition that associates desire and pleasure with suffering um, might, uh, at least in some accounts or some visions of it be kind of inherently literary, which is also something that, you know, people before me have talked about. The, the you know, the word masochism um, is obviously, well, or not obviously, it's named after a novelist um, and in kind of early sexological um, studies of masochism in the late 19th century, um, a lot of space is devoted to accounts of what patients were reading. Um, so, you know, Amber Musser is an example of someone who has argued that masochism has always been a kind of fundamentally literary perversion. Um, and at the same time, um, wanting to think not just about how is masochism maybe literary, but um, what are the ways in which writing itself can at least be imagined as a kind of machine for masochistic enjoyment. Um, it's funny because when I tell people that I'm writing a book about writing and masochism, if they are writers, they're inevitably like, oh, ha ha, yeah. Um, and I think most of the time when people sort of colloquially think about masochism, this was a sort of surprise to me, but I think most people associate it with like pain or unpleasantness, but, but not necessarily with pleasure. So people are like, oh yeah, writing really does suck. Um, or like running, you know, people think about other things that are like hard and unpleasant, but you do them anyway. Um, but boating. Like what? Boating. Boating? Well, boating too. Probably. Voting. Voting, yes. Voting and boating, both famously horrible activities. I think they are. Yeah, no, I know. Um, yeah, so, okay, so that's what I was thinking about, um, <laughs> really running aground here in this voting boat. Um, I wanted to, uh, just, I'll just say quickly two other things I wanted to think about. Um, most of the accounts of masochism that are most persuasive and like important to me um, seem to rely on a model where the subject, the, the masochistic person, is fundamentally safe. So masochism is, is like a form of um, a kind of autonomous fantasy um, and usually kind of ends up 
in some way, I mean, Fanon's white masochism is also like this. It sort of ends up like shoring up a fundamental kind of um, privilege, security, safety. Um, and I was interested in thinking about uh, forms of masochism or kind of ideas of masochism where um, pleasure is happening, desire is happening in relation to um, actual danger, actual um, harm, actual uh, violence. And then the other thing is just that I was interested in thinking about theater um, in relation to the relationship between um, masochism and writing, um, because again, I don't think, I mean, everyone says masochism is theatrical, including you, and that means lots of different things. Um, but I started to think about the way that playwriting as writing towards enactment, which will inevitably be painful and upsetting for the writer, um, and also pleasurable, uh, might itself be a kind of especially good model for uh, masochistic cultural practice. So that's the other, I guess, important thing. Uh, wait, so, but, but you agree that masochism is theatrical. Yeah, I do think it's theatrical. Well, whatever. Also, everything is everything. But the um, the the form, the theatricalities of masochism I'm interested in are less about sort of like like um, pretending or showing off or like um, exhibiting oneself, and more about thinking about the different ways that theater is also a machine for displacing yourself or kind of like sitting in the dark, um, all that stuff. But can I actually, before we go on any further? Can I ask you to read some of your recent work about masochism? We're, oh, we're already doing that? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wow. See, I'm on the spot. Now I am the boy masochist. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that later. Yeah. You're gendered. Okay, I haven't actually read these in front of an audience before, so this will be like extra embarrassing. I don't know where they are. Okay, no, I found them. All right, I'm just, I'll just read two. I've been writing these things that I call Dom songs, which are, just to be completely upfront about it, about how in order to escape the isolation of the pandemic, I hired a dominatrix. So I'm gonna read two Dom songs, or I, meaning the lyric I, we don't know, the poet and the speaker of the poem, different entities. This is uh, Dom song number 10. And then I'll read number seven. This is for every boy who ever picked me last for basketball. I'm lying flat as a fish on the floor of the fast train your apartment becomes when you press your foot to my face. This is for every therapist who ever asked me if I'd made a plan. My plan was not to get locked up by answering that question. I'm practicing mindfulness outside Sonic in a pink skirt and skates. This is for AA and every other church I ditched for my people, the dirtbags. This is for the dirtbags, my people. This is for every winter I hated and every summer I wasted. I'm the glitter rubbing off. I'm one thin dime. This is for my enlarged prostate. This is for the boy you fucked with the stupid tattoo. I'm emotion activated singing fish on the wall. You're a Budweiser lampshade above a pool table, color-coding hard men bent across the felt. I flap my wet fish lips and you go dark. I'm very like, I'm a bit over-caffeinated, so I'm trying not to talk like Cary Grant and his girl Friday. Why? <laughs> well, why would you not want to do that? Because you can hardly understand what he's saying. You have to, you have to keep rewinding it. That's how Howard Hawks got you to pay twice for the same movie. This is actually Dom Song 5 I'm going to read, which is about, based on a fragment by Sappho. Aphrodite's like, sigh, what now, Sappho? What's your crazy heart want now? Aphrodite, I am 17 again. I am singing along with The Cure. I'm a bald girl with a big gut in a bad wig. Aphrodite says, there are things you're better off not knowing. Like what, says Sappho, brighter and whiter than snow. The goddess says, against the lucky Eros plots. And Sappho goes, but starships were meant to fly, and the horse meadow is in bloom. And the goddess says, careful girl, I was born when the harvest castrated the sky. 
but Sappho's staring at the sea. Big summer rips through long night. Pan is fucking a goat on the beach. So now what? Thank you. Um, so I asked you to do this talk with me um, because we both have been interested in um, what these two things, writing and masochism, um, have to do with each other. And, uh, and because it seems fun to think together about how masochism maybe operates in our writing lives. Yeah, I don't, I mean, and I've been thinking about this question, right, because clearly there's a relationship. I mean, you, you mentioned already Massoc, but the, the very, for me, the very fact that sadomasochism, the idea, is a, is a, a portmanteau of Saad and Massoc, people who wrote stories, is, va is very interesting. I mean, I know that's been overexplored in the literature. But it's still, I find it very interesting because the first, and I'm gonna contradict something I said to you the other day, but like one of, some of the first, well, some of my first memories of masochistic desire were prompted by reading. Reading, uh, first of all, a Dean Kuntz novel that my grandmother had, which is like really, I think sort of appropriately tawdry. And then, uh, an issue of The Incredible Hulk that came out in the 70s, both of which staged scenes of, 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 of erotic domination, and my youthful imagination was very taken by this. So, but the truth is that I don't know what its relation to my own writing is, right? Um, and I don't know how I'm supposed to find out. I do have some thoughts about something else that's related to that, but first I should maybe ask you how your own writing, to the extent that it is maybe something you haven't explored in, 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 in the book, how does masochism come out for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I think that in a way the model of sort of writing as perversion that feels most immediately available to me is, um, is playwriting because, um, because it is, I think, fundamentally perverse. It's a, it's a sort of exhausting project of composition that um, insists on its own um, insufficiency and failure and, um, you know, is fundamentally a kind of... Um, like a mechanism for providing for an experience which will always be more than compositionally what one could have um, wanted or made as a writer. And so thinking about that, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if you feel this way, but it, you know, for me, like writing, it, obviously it's kind of like torture, but it's, it's so much easier and nicer than like actually most things people have to do. I mean, I think I used to think writing was really hard and then, you know, I like got a job and, you know, I have children, whatever. And so I think, I think now I don't, I don't have the same sense of writing as like a form of torture that I might have had before, which I think is what people usually think of when you say, oh yeah, writing and masochism. Um, on the other hand, I do, I don't know, I, I, I guess I think um, one of the things I'm interested in is this kind of like dialectic um, that I think comes up a lot in the text that I'm looking at um, between masochism as a kind of um, stepping forward and making oneself vulnerable. So a kind of, you could say like a, a, a moment of performing or of publishing oneself um, and thinking about how that uh, that is itself, publishing itself, is always kind of courting the possibility of a kind of violent rejection or response from the world. Um, but then, of course, also interested in the ways that writing, um, as we know, is like a technology for um, retreating and for disappearing and for um, providing for other people to um, take up space or take up room in a way that, um, one might wish to do, but um, more profoundly enjoy 
um, refusing oneself the permission to do. Well, but more, but but this is interesting because for the for the the playwright, writing is necessarily a form of self concealment, whereas for the lyric poet, even granted the feint that I just rehearsed about the distinction between the speaker and the biological poet, the voice of the poet is what one hears, right? The I is what one hears, whereas you're writing for other voices, right? Yeah. And that makes a difference. So that so we could be talking about different forms of masochism now. Yeah, I think so. I'm guiding us toward the later discussion of the, the difference. But I did think, this only just occurred to me, you were trained psychoanalytically, whereas I was trained to repress my emotions, so. I wasn't trained psychoanalytically. I'm not a psychoanalyst. I know, but you have, I just you like know, to read it, yeah. You, you, you this, is, this is a false I'm Jewish, is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. And you're a Christian. I am not a, I'm not really a Christian. This is, we don't even know. Let's talk about, let's talk about this some more. No, no. all right, fine. But this, <laughs> Jesus. But see, this, this, this only just occurred to me. I often tell this origin story about when I decided to be a successful poet. Like I always wanted to be a poet, but when I really was like, fuck it, I'm going to, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna succeed and I'm gonna be in the- Make bank. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, for a poet, this is not an impressive achievement, but the, the moment was a workshop in college where I had written something which I still can cringingly recall a lines from. And we workshopped it and I had been expecting a rather rapturous reception. And it was just, it bombed terribly. And it, both, it bombed most, for me, um, most glaringly uh, in the eyes of, the, of, of the, the girl in the class I had a crush on, Sarah Chestnut, who, who is, uh, and she, I, I caught her leaning over to Christina and whispering something about the poem and they both snickered. Mm. And like, I happened to be like staring like this at her at the, at the time and she caught my eye and went oh, and looked like she wasn't talking about me and she was and it was very humiliating. So it's born in a scene of humiliation, which I had never thought about until just now because talking with you makes me make connections because, and, um, you know, Sarah wrote to me after my last book came out. She sent me an email. I mean, we're friends on Instagram. She's like got a kid and she's married and we're both extremely old. But uh, I was really, you know, wanting to impress Sarah was a lot, was it was a large, uh, uh, honestly, uh, had a lot to do with my ambition as a poet. Mm -hmm. And obviously once I lost tr touch with Sarah for a while, it, it moved on to other things, but that was the scene, was wanting to redeem the humiliation that I felt but also connected, therefore, to the erotic attachment of that humiliation, mm -hmm. right? And maybe extend it, like, like to dwell in that moment of humiliation for the rest of your life by continuing to write poems. Yes, if only we had been like uh, in, in a, some field that was, was less embarrassing than being a poet. Like just being a poet is embarrassing. Like being a playwright is not embarrassing. You what? put on plays, no, no it's fine. Mm, um, both embarrassing, can we compromise? <laughs> I suppose being a writer at all is embarrassing. But I do want to say, I want to say something. I've been thinking about the role of repetition, which I want you to talk about. But before you talk about it, um, you know, I was thinking about repetition in my own writing. And one of the, and the, the second poem about my dom that I wrote, I quoted her. She had this, she liked to say during scenes, if, I don't know if people know what scenes are, but we're gonna skip past the definition. She liked to say, pain is repetition. And she would often say it more than once. And she would make me write on the whiteboard the rules, there were rules, and I would have to repeat them in the right order every time. And I was thinking about this, and obviously repetition is at the, at the, the heart of the psychoanalytic critique. Um, and I was thinking about Beyond the Pleasure Principle, but I also wanted to look at, at, again, I hadn't read Kierkegaard on repetition in 20 years or so, so I got Kierkegaard out last night, and I was looking through repetition, and <laughs> I had forgotten that the central scene in repetition takes place in the theater by Kierkegaard, and I don't know if you've read this or not. But I don't think so. Mm, maybe, I don't know. There's this amazing scene where he's, he's, he's just luxuriating in the pleasure of 
the theater and he sees a girl who is reacting to the play. The play is perfect. He's having a great time. He's in love with this girl that he's never seen before. And he wants to go back to the theater the next night to repeat the, the, the experience. But he goes back the next night for the repetition and it's all changed. The, the actors are off. They're not as funny. The girl's not there. He has a migraine. Everything's just shitty. And he, right. and he comes to the realization that through this, that repetition is both the key to pleasure and also impossible to truly achieve satisfaction through. Right, and I think that's actually what theater is for, is to, is to make us deal with that fact about repetition and about pleasure. Um, do, should I read? Yes, please. Uh, are you gonna read the... Maybe I'll read the first one. The first one. Because that is sort of about a trope. Um, a trope that repeats across a lot of masochism lit. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from um, the first. This is the beginning of chapter one um, in my book, which is called You're Not a Masochist. When Gilles Deleuze argued in 1963 that sexual perversions must be understood through the literary values of their canonical authors, he based his own analysis of masochism on the 19th century stories of Leopold von Sacher Massach, after whom that perversion had been named. Perverse readers today, however, know a literature of masochism that extends far beyond the works of its namesake. This literature includes the 50 odd years of best selling BDSM erotica running from the mid century sensation The Story of O to the millennial success of Fifty Shades. And alongside these works of ebullient fantasy, in a kind of adjacent but apparently distinct canon, a succession of more sober stories about masochism, whose attitude toward this mode of desire often seems painfully unerotic. Among the latter group we might place, for example, Elfrida Jelinek's 1983 novel, The Piano Teacher, about an obsessive spinster whose fantasies are shattered when her strapping male student viciously enacts them, or the works of Mary Gateskill, including the 1991 novel Two Girls Fat and Thin, and the stories in her 1988 collection Bad Behavior. At first glance, it would seem fairly easy to distinguish between these two groups of texts, where Susan Sontag argued in 1967 that pornographic writings could be divided into trash and authentic literature, today we might be more inclined to categorize masochism texts not only in terms of their cultural capital, but also in terms of the genre of reading experience each seems to offer us. So frankly, erotic texts like O oh or Fifty Shades just are masochistic fantasies for readers to get off on, whereas texts that situate their characters' fantasies within a real world hostile to fantasy, as Jelinek and Gateskill do, invite us to the more sardonic pleasures of recognizing the ways masochistic desire may be doomed. As you'll have guessed, my aim in pointing out this intuitive distinction is to observe that the works themselves actually undermine it, that a surprising kind of continuity obtains between these two groups of texts, like the trashy ones and the good ones. This continuity, moreover, is due less to any definitional stability of masochism than to what we might call its profoundly destabilizing tendency its tendency to destabilize not only the masochistic subject herself, but also the classifying distinction between what or who belongs in masochistic fantasy and what belongs outside of it. To see this, we can begin by focusing on a trope that recurs throughout all this literature, wherein I, a character, declare that there are no limits to what I will do or suffer for your enjoyment. In this gesture, rather than tell you all or indeed any of the particular things I want us to do, I renounce the particularity of fantasy altogether, ceding it to you. I will do whatever you command, says the hero Severin in Sacher Masak's Venus and Furs. I am ready to endure anything. <clears throat> 
I'll do whatever you like, says O in the story of O, and we read later that, quote, no pleasure, no joy, no figment of her imagination could compete with the happiness she felt at the notion that he could do anything with her, that there was no limit, no restriction in the manner with which on her body he might search for pleasure. And in Gateskill's story, A Romantic Weekend, Beth, who longs to be, quote, crushed like an insect, tells her lover, anything you do will be all right. I would do anything with you. Anything. In other words, all I want is whatever you want and to get to feel you wanting it. For all its earnest passion, this anything has the tactical advantage of, of obscuring my own particular fantasies, which might disgust or worse amuse you, there's something cowardly in the way this figure cajoles you into presenting your fantasy so I won't have to. But anything is more than just a demurral. If it weren't, then stories of masochistic desire would just become showplaces for the specific surprising desires of tops, which they rarely do. While anything is manifestly my invitation to you to disclose and enact your desire and simultaneously a refusal to specify mine, it is also always a kind of self-fashioning and self-display. I will be the one who was able to want the most repugnant, cruel things you could do to me. The more unbearable they are, the better they will prove my powers of wanting. Because in fact, saying I will do or suffer anything is above all an attempt to circumscribe every possible event within the radius of my permission to make traumatic infraction impossible by enclosing you inside the fiery circle of my proleptic consent. Uh, as a moment of elated bluster, do anything to me bears out Deleuze's claim that in masochism the ego triumphs. But there's also something slightly embarrassing about this boast in a way that's a bit like participatory theater while pretending to unleash your activity, all it does is delimit it. Somehow the term through which I shirk the particularity of my own desire has the effect of neutralizing yours. Anything you do to me will be because I want you to. Whatever it is you do will pale against the backdrop of my own impressive capacity for having wanted it. Thus masochistic erotica tends to operate as a frenzied elaboration, not of your desire, but of mine. This focus becomes hyperbolically dogged in Fifty Shades of Grey, although the tender sadist Edward Grey inducts the narrator Anna into a landscape of sexual ritual he has already created, the narrative itself consists of a relentless blow-by-blow -blow account of every twinge Anna feels in the course of her relations with this handsome but troubled billionaire. It is difficult to imagine a narrative more intent on making sure we are tracking the protagonist's desire. In the climactic scene of the first novel, Anna, initially reluctant to indulge her new boyfriend's violent proclivities, suddenly asks him to hurt her. I can soothe him, she reflects, join him briefly in the darkness and bring him into the light. Show me, I whisper. Show you? Show me how much it can hurt. Through rhetoric that presents her own desire as an empty mirror of the others, the masochist, in fact, turns the other's behavior into a reflection of her own erotic courage. But as anyone familiar with this literature knows, things can never be so simple. The arrival of actual jouissance exceeds the fantasy and shatters the desire that had propelled us toward it. This account of sex is not specific to masochism, but masochism renders it in stark burlesque, yielding stories of subjects who get what they want only to find it unbearable even within the tales that seem designed to get us and them off. You take my fantasies too seriously, Severin whines in Venus and Furs. Anna storms out of the Fifty Shades playroom in tears. Even O begs not to be whipped again. Even if I agree to it now, she says, I couldn't bear it. The desire for anything that had comprised the masochist hero's identity runs aground on the particular something that her partner uses this license to do. In the event, all the masochist wants is for the biting or burning or flogging to stop. Actual suffering makes her desire to suffer suddenly inaccessible, and with it, the vision of self that desire was supposed to sustain. In sex, that is, she finds she cannot be a masochist. And the point is that um, this problem is built 
kind of not only into good or realistic um, or critical depictions of masochism, um, but seems to be fundamental even to masochistic erotica, this, this, this moment when the fantasy falls apart and it's all too much and it's terrible. And so then the um, argument that I'm kind of going on to make is that, um, is that that moment where the fantasy seems to be broken is actually internal to the fantasy. Um, you know, that, that masochism is a form of, of desire and in fact a form of fantasy that orients it itself towards the, the outer edge of, um, of fantasy, towards the moment when fantasy itself falls apart. Yeah, and first of all, I wanna ask if you actually read all of Fifty Shades of Grey or did you just flip through it and find appropriate scenes? I'm not gonna answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, think that, I think that you just did. What I would say, and I, I don't, I actually completely agree with you because I've, you know, you know, I read Venus in Furs and there's that one moment in Venus in Furs where she seems to have been converted to sadism. And she... Uh, this is the, the, the beloved. The, the woman in Furs. She... I mean, she's, he likes the furs. I think I've always been disturbed by that part, actually. <laughs> the furs are freaky. But she's like, no, we're going, I'm going to whip you. And now here my lover is going to come and he's going to whip you. And, and Severin is like, no, this isn't what I wanted. But then at the end, it all turns out that, oh, she was still just playing. Even that was fantasy, right? But what I want to know is, and I don't, I don't disagree, but isn't this just constitutive of desire as such? That, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think I think that is how desire works. That there's always this like mismatch between desire and enjoyment. But um, but I guess what I think is that the kind of masochism that I'm interested in is is one that um, that actually is able to take that fact about desire and eroticize that fact, put that fact at the center of kind of imaginative and erotic life. Okay, so that the very frustration of desire is the point. I think so. Yeah and the exceeding of it. Well, but that's the question too, like, um, is there a stage at which the, the fantasy truly is uh, not disrupted, but something happens to, to exceed the, all right, so the masochists of Al is always frustrated because it always runs up against the limits of, of the other person, right? The other person is, is always going to impose something that the masochist does not desire, at which point the masochist will say no. But there is, is there a way of getting past that no into a further yes? Well, you yes. tell me. Well, n I don't know. That's <laughs> uh, I mean, when your dom makes you do something you don't want to do, right? That's happened before. Okay, well, this is now we're getting very personal. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, we do want to, we have to, it's already 3.40, so we probably sh oh, yeah. should, we should move into questions anyway. Yeah. Good, <laughs> saved <laughs> by the bell. <laughs> right when it was getting, but uh, but uh, should we say something about what your 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 conception of the what you call boy versus girl masochism? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, part of why I think it's fun to talk to Michael about this, um, and I think this is like borne out in the passages we read, is um, right. You are a lyric poet. You write in the first person, and your there's a way that your sort of like literary performance of masochism, I mean, I don't mean to flatten it, but basic, I, I think these poems are complicated um, and strange, but I. It, it's fine. Um, but, you, but you're sort of like, hey, this is happening to me. I'm feeling these things and I'm, you know, getting off on them. And my way of doing that is to like write <laughs> this book. Um, about Deleuze and Freud. About Henry and, James. Yeah, and Henry James. And, um, you know, part of what Freud says in his most famous essay on masochism that I've been kind of obsessed with um, is that his, his girl patients, he had all his patients apparently have these violent fantasies, um, but, uh, but the, the men who come to him and report these violent fantasies, Freud will be like, so you think it may be like you're the one being hit in the fantasy? And eventually the men will be like, no, 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 yes, yes, it's me. Yeah, you got me, it's me. Um, but the women won't. Like, they will never say, yes, I'm the one being hit. 
slash loved in the fantasy. Um, Freud, in fact, has to like posit a whole subconscious fantasy for them in which it is them being hurt. And this idea that, you know, and you know, the point obviously isn't that like only girls can have what you just, yeah, girl masochism, well, but the idea- Well, it's not biological in your Well, it's not only not biological, but it's also just, I mean, it's just, it's the way that he breaks it up um, is along lines of gender, but th there's a version of masochism that is totally dependent on installing other people in the place of your desire and in the, you know, giving your pleasure to other people. Like um, writing characters for the stage. For example, writing characters for the stage. Um, and, and a different version that's like, yup, it's me. Um, I'm having, I'm, hit me. I'm right here. Um, that's the one that, you know, that I feel like you're writing in bodies as against mine, so. Yeah, and it's an annoying theory because it, I want to disagree with it, and yet it keeps being borne out. Yeah. In practice. I'm always right. Yep. Should we take uh, questions? Yes, please. I have a mic too. I can do that thing. The thing where you roam toward right. the questioner. Where I bring the mic to people. Hi. Okay, Hi. I'm speaking first because nobody raised their hand, but um, without, um, without wanting to be like too reductive, I'm wondering if both of you have I, um, thoughts on like a cure. <laughs> I think it's really hard for me to like, as much as I relate um, as a writer and person to masochism, it's also hard for me not to like recoil from that term and think that like I, um, I want to find a cure for that masochism e either through the writing or independently and then my writing will be cured of it. So um, I wonder what you, you two think about the idea of cure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like you have sometimes framed like masochistic sexual practice as itself a kind of cure of worse things for you. Um, I think for me, I am kind of specifically interested in ways of talking about this that are not redemptive um, and that kind of insist on a certain um, endlessness, a kind of pessimistic endlessness. Um, but it's a really, it's like a really fun question. Like what would it, what would it be to be cured? Oh, I mean, I guess in Venus and Furs, he is cured, and the way he's cured is he becomes a sadist and beats his, um, beats his girlfriend. So we are not advocating. I mean, um, but uh, unless but she wants it. No, no, yeah, okay, but um, but so yes, I mean, I guess right. The 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 way that masochism is originally pathologized is along these gender lines, right? It's like the problem is that it makes men act like women. Um, yeah, that's everywhere. So, so that's a model that can be cured because you just like man up. Um, or you just accept that you're going to be like a woman, right? Right, I guess self-acceptance, but there's something about, I, you I know. I mean, but self-acceptance is so passe. Well, I just think, you know, the point is, to, like, I think that in the things I'm looking at, at least, there is like a mechanism, a necessary mechanism of self-disgust that keeps the motor running and so it's important, like this is a subjectivity that kind of needs to always be encountering its own insufficiency um, in order to keep generating, like in order to keep fantasizing. And so yeah, so I guess I'm saying no cure. But also it's just the question of what is the cure for, for society, right? I mean, if we didn't have, uh, uh, if we weren't structured unequally, um, if we weren't gendered unequally, there wouldn't be that, that, that question of, oh, this is a man who wants to be like a woman, right? Where, where that's because women are subjugated. If, if we, they're possibly in a more equal society, masochism would look completely different. I mean, yeah, there wouldn't be masochism in any other society. Obviously, it's totally historically determined. But, but we have it, so. But that's what the cure would be, I'm saying. For me, I don't Revolution. Think <laughs> yes, Yeah, uh, 100. <laughs> Revolution would cure it. Well, or just extinction, you know. I don't know, for me, like, uh, this is just, since I, 
I, I despise therapy. This is the cure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really curious because um, I see that you like, obviously, I'm like nervous to even ask this question, honestly, because um, Michael Robbins was my professor. Uh, Should so I give you an A? <laughs> yes, thank God. There you go. <laughs> um, but I'm just so grateful for this opportunity and, and to hear both of you um, talk. But I am curious because especially in Julia, on your book, you um, mention a lot of theory, but I, and also gate scale, which is also like, especially in looking at Veronica and in connection with other theorists that you're looking at. Um, you, I don't see Butler there. So I'm curious, like, especially because we have cisgendered female, cisgendered male conversing about masochism, if you have thoughts about masochism as performance and performativity and how that relates to sort of this broader conversation about what lies within us, I guess, and then what comes out in other ways. Yeah, I mean, you're asking specifically in relation to the performance of gender, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess one thing I can say is that I, I have, like, um, in writing the book, uh, the question of sort of, like, when I'm referring to the masochist, like, which pronoun to use is kind of interesting because like one would just use they, them pronouns, right, in general. Um, but, uh, but in this literature, the sort of like erotic charge of the gender binary is so strong. Um, and the idea, so for example, in Freud, um, the female or the, 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 the girls who come to Freud and report this fantasy always substitute boys in the fantasy um, for themselves. There's something about the sort of, the fantasy of a kind of um, completely binary identity. Um, and I think that this seems also obviously, though also obviously differently to operate in relation to race, but there's something about, um, about binary identity categories that seems really fundamental to a lot of, obviously not all, but a lot of the kind of, um, masochistic fantasy um, and world making that I'm encountering. That's not really, a, that's not an answer about performance, but I guess what I think is that like, one thing we see is that, um, you know, that fantasy itself has a performative charge in the Butler sense, right? That like, um, and yeah, that, um, that fantasizing, <sighs> fantasy isn't something that happens like underneath, um, everyday performance of self, right? Fantasy um, is part of that performance. Even private fantasy is part of that performance. And that's, I think, one of the things that masochism makes really visible. Thank you. I think we have time for one, mo one more. Frank Hensker. Of course, um, Arto and uh, uh, Theater of Cruelty comes to mind. So the question also of the tortured audience, uh, the, the enjoyment to torture audiences and audiences enjoying being tortured by long plays, warm plays, you know, the, the, of theater and stuff, but still going back to it. Any thoughts? Well, she has a, you have something on Arto in there, no? Sure, yeah, um, I mean, but you know, I, okay, so like Arto famously says, when I say cruelty, I mean difficult and cruel for myself, first of all. So I think, um, you know, I think Arto is a, is a sort of classic example of... Um, the boy masochist. Well, well, yeah, I guess so, but actually of the kind of like reversibility idea that masochism can express itself in a kind of sadism um, and vice versa. And I, I guess, yeah, this question of like what is happening for the audience. Um, I'm sorry to just talk about Freud all the time, but Freud has this wild... Psychoanalytically trained. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> Jewish. Um, Freud has this wild early essay um, where he basically offers as his theory of genre um, that the thing specific to drama as opposed to other genres of literature is that the audience... Um, gets masochistic pleasure. Like, 
this idea that um, enjoying suffering is so fundamental to theatrical spectatorship that it actually defines it, like it defines it as a cultural activity, which, you know, I don't know, he's probably, I feel like... That's from Aristotle. It's, well, no, I mean, it's, it's from Aristotle as, yeah, as tragedy, but even, well, whatever, that's... Oh, you're saying as such, okay, the whole, even Yeah, comedy. like drama, any drama, um, that it, it reaches deeper into us and because it hurts us more. Um, and that seems borne out in, like, how people actually feel about even theater that seems sort of, like, pleasant and easy, how much we dread, dread going to the theater, um, even when we didn't write the play. But I guess the other thing that I would say is just that for me, and this is of course partly because I am a theater maker, but when I think about like what, what does theater as a cultural practice mean now, there's some way that I feel like people watching theater are always watching people making theater, right? Like we're always watching the, um, the artistic production and we're like maybe even more aware of it because um, you know, because it's like live and weird and kind of not the, not the thing that we're used, not the way that we're most used to taking in narrative anymore. So I actually think there is a kind of like reversibility or identification between audience and artist built into theater in a way that's a little different from other media. So that the question of like, what, it, what are the artists feeling and what the audience, I'm not saying it's easier to identify with like characters in theater because I don't think that's true. Um, but the question of like, I, th I do think the audience has a certain access to the sort of like authorial position in theater, like imagining what it is like to have made or to be making this thing. Like that is part of why we go to the theater specifically. Um, to imagine that. So there's some way that I guess, I guess just to say like maybe I'm not taking super seriously the distinction between artist and audience in this book. I think it's, it's like a kind of a flimsy distinction actually. Thank you, Frank. Um, all right, cool. I think that's time, that was great. Thank you, Julia Thank and you. Michael. Uh, if, if you care to stick around, Star Busby is going to be giving a performance in five minutes that I have to go introduce. Um, Star is also brilliant, and um, I'm looking forward to this showing. And then, uh, uh, then Niall Jones will be in this room at 5 p.m. I'm like trying to, we're heading into 4 p.m. 4 p.m., Star Busby, 5 p.m., dance artist Niall Jones in here, and then we'll close out the night with a performance by Luciana Achugar in the Siegel Theater from 6 to approximately 8 p.m., prelude party tonight at 9 o'clock at the Tank. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>